Hey guys, just a quick note up front. This episode originally released back in October 18th, 2016. I'm re-releasing it now because the Cirque du Soleil Curios opened here in Houston on the 6th of April and will be running until May 21st. Head over to Cirque du Soleil.com slash Curios for tickets. On to the show. It's Reality Check with Craig Price. I'm an idiot. Four minutes in and I'm already wrong. I'm like a monkey. Hello, look at me. You're like a beautiful mind. I'm more like Forrest Gump. (laughs) Craig Price is the man. I knew it. Craig, shut up. It's Reality Check with Craig Price. This week, Amelie Robitaille is here to discuss Cirque du Soleil and their new touring show, Curios. Welcome to the show. I'm excited to bring this episode to you because we all know Cirque du Soleil and the amazing performances they've done for years. And their latest touring show, Curios, Cabinets of Curiosities opened already in New York City in September, and it's touring, so it'll be in Miami, Dallas, and Houston in the coming months. But important to me and some of my listeners, they'll be coming to Houston at the Sam Houston Race Park starting April 6, 2017, and going for the entire month of April. So you can get tickets now for any of the shows, regardless of where you live, New York, Miami, Dallas, or Houston. Go to CirqueDuSoleil.com slash Curios. See, when I was presented the opportunity to talk to Amelie about the Cirque, as I like to call it, being on the in crowd, I wanted to go behind the scenes a little bit and see how it is they do what they do. How do they find their folks? What it's like to be part of the Cirque. See, I'm not lying. That's what I like to call it. And I know many of you felt the same, so thank you all who posted questions, and I think I got to all of them. But of course, if I didn't, you can let me know by going to realitycheckpodcast.com slash feedback or emailing me direct at craig at speakercraigprice.com. I'll be sure to pass your question along and get that answered for you, because I know they're going to be coming back in April. But right now, let's close our eyes, open our imaginations, maybe stretch out our hammies for good luck, and let's talk Cirque du Soleil with Amelie Robite. Now, I've had a chance to see Cirque du Soleil over the years, uh, sometimes in Vegas, also sometimes with the touring company. I saw uh, Verakai, which was a fantastic show, and then we just saw Love last year in Las Vegas. So when you come up with these shows, as far as like concept, how far in advance does it take from concept to opening night on a show? Right, so that's a good question because the creation process of a new show at Cirque du Soleil is quite long, surprisingly long. So I would say from the moment we hire a writer-director, which is Michelle Laprise in the case of uh, Curios, um, it's about two years before opening night. Um, what, the, what the process is usually, he'll hire some of his designers and creative team members, such as the costume designer, the choreo- choreography designer, makeup designers, sets and props designers, music composers, and they'll start working on the on the whole storyline and, and design of the show. And then we will go into the casting of the artists that will be part of the cast. And then about six months prior to opening, that's when the artists arrive in our studio in Montreal and they start all the, the rehearsals, the fittings of their costumes, the, the, the training of their makeup, and for uh, six months, and then we'll open to the audience, uh, usually always in Montreal when we're talking Big Top show. And when you think of, like with Curios, you've got uh, an opening act, which is unusual. So you have your normal act that you take, it looks like it takes several years to finally start with. You have an opening act, or I guess you call it a welcoming act. What made you decide to add that to Curios? Yeah, so there's a lot of things in Curious that are different that we've never done before. And I think part of that is because Michelle Lapriz, the director, is such a creative person who's been working at Cirque du Soleil for over 15 years now. He started in the casting department and then eventually made it to special event department, which uh, he was directing um, shows like the Madonna uh, halftime performance at the Super Bowl and then went on and directed her MDNA tour show. And he's done very, very different things um, in this task of organizing special events. So when he got the mandate of uh, directing and writing a Big Top show, I think he kind of wanted to think outside the box. So he made a list of things. After 30 years, we sort sort of, although we were not really happy to hear that, we sort of heard sometimes that we were becoming predictable. 
So uh, Michel really made a list where he put together the, what we do out of habits and what do we do out of necessity. And the list of things we do out of habits, he really wanted to go a different way. I noticed uh, through shows, and it's, it becomes a staple, the net jumping in things, which is amazing. Uh, but I've seen right. that on, on several shows, and I don't think it's a bad thing that we see it more often than not because it, it becomes something that people look forward to. But I can certainly understand maybe they want to try something outside. Right, and the Acronet itself is amazing. I can talk to you a little bit more about that. But before we go into Acronet, um, so the welcoming act. So you're, you're used to seeing at Cirque what we call the awakening, which is a pre-show animation in the house when people are coming in and sitting down in their seats. There's going to be some characters interacting in the audience. But the welcoming act is actually fun because it's on the tent. So as you're walking on site before you're even entering uh, our, our big top, you have characters who are who are standing on top of the tent and actually performing for like 15 minutes to welcome um, the audience members and, and kind of put them in the mindset of the show already. Obviously, that is uh, dependent of weather. <laughs> when it's raining or when it's really cold or too hot, we cannot perform on top of the tent for, for safety reasons. But uh, you'll be probably uh, lucky enough to see, uh, to see that act when we're going to be uh, in Houston. And, and then also there's a new thing that we've we added to this show that we've never done before, which is before the show starts, when people are sitting in the house, we have on stage a rope bridge um, that is mainly for the purpose of audience member to to get to have a sneak peek backstage, cross the rope bridge over the stage, and then sit in, in their seats again before the show, show starts. The whole br the rope bridge the rope bridge has no other purpose in the show than just for audience member to walk across uh, over the stage, which is giving the audience members the perspective of artists when they're on stage, which is awesome. Well, that sounds fantastic because that's the one thing that while you're watching them do their acrobatics and and fly through the air, the, that perspective just for a small glimpse is like, how do they do that? What it, what would it feel like? It's it's quite amazing. So that's a great element to add to just a, a pre-show, just to get people warmed up. Exactly. When they're pre planning this entire out, are you also preparing at the same time for it to tour, or do you worry about let's get the show great it's in Montreal and we're going to have it wherever it's going to be? So if it's in Las Vegas, we set it for Las Vegas, but at some point it's going to go out on the road. Is that something you think of in advance or do you just try to get the show as great as you can for the venue that you have? So basically, uh, when a show is created, it's either for a, a resident venue or it's for the big top or it's for arena. But it, it has to be created thinking that in mind because uh, let's say in the case of Curious, we are traveling. So we have to make everything you know, packable <laughs> into trailers and then uh, reusable every city that we go to. So when the show is created, obviously you have to think about those rest restrictions of being in the tent where we have four masks that are holding the tents that are there and that are surrounding our stage. So those are limitations that we have to deal with when we're creating the show versus a show that's going to go in arena uh, that we have to build and make sure that it's not too heavy so we can hang in most of the ceilings of most of the venues in North America or all around the world. And another thing that has to be taken in, in consideration is that most of our shows will have a lifetime of maybe 15 to 20 years, and we got to make sure that we're creating them in in a time period that's not going to become, uh, how do you say, aged more right. quickly, or that's going to you know continue and be kind of accurate for 15 to 20 years, and to all those different audiences and cultures that we're going to present it to. So let's talk about. This show, uh, Curios, which is going to be in Houston starting in April 6th, it's 2017, and of course we're talking about this well in advance because tickets become very scarce fairly quickly because when Cirque du Soleil comes to, sound, to town, people can't wait to go see this. So, so where was the, what's the concept and the theme of Curios? So um, the whole storyline of Curious is taking place in the mid-19th century, which is the Industrial Revolution, the era of all the great inventions, such as uh, electricity bulbs, railroad systems, bicycles, telegrams, um, name it, gramophones, which was, for Michel Laprise, a very inspirational era because people believed then that everything was possible. 
Uh, so we're kind of celebrating that era and that that feeling of human intelligence and everything is possible. Uh, so we're this, the story is taking place. We're in the laboratory of this inventor, a little bit of a mad scientist, whose inventions um, are surrounding the stage, and he's trying to travel to a parallel universe. But things are going wrong, so it's the characters from that parallel universe that are traveling down into his laboratory and bringing life to all his inventions and kind of turning his world upside down and showing him that reality is relative, time is, is relative. Uh, the show starts at 11.11, it ends at 11.12. Was it just a dream or did time stop kind of thing? So it's very different than what you've seen before because we're in a real era. The characters are a little bit more human-inspired than some of the other shows, and, and their props and their environment is made out of real objects. So you see chairs on stage, you see uh, a, a hand. Well, we take all of these things in different proportions, though. So. Um, like a hand is a, mechan- a giant mechanical mechanical hand, which is a platform for the contortionist to perform. But it it weighs 750 pounds and it's about six meter long, um, which is one of the I think the nicest props in this show. But uh, it's very steampunk in its aesthetics. Obviously, um, a Cirque du Soleil way to do steampunk. Uh, I, I think when I first got hired to work on Curious, I was, I, I didn't even know what steampunk was and I went and I looked online for it and then I realized as we're traveling and presenting the show to different audiences, it's a big thing. The steampunk thing is a big thing. It's like we have people who dress up to come see the show, which is pretty, uh, pretty inspiring. Well, it, here in Houston right now, the uh, Renaissance Festival, the Texas Renaissance Festival is going on and steampunk is always a big part of it. So yeah, steampunk is huge. I, I didn't realize how big it was until I started to go to these conventions and started to see people selling steampunk uh, attire, costumes, uh, pocket watches that made up all these little gears and things. So it is, I saw the picture of the mechanical hand. It looks fantastic. And it looks like it's not only just a, a platform. It says in the uh, that it might also be at times a character versus just a piece of, of a prop. Right, it's 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 seen as a character, but it's also a prop and a platform. Um, it's also used for a hand puppetry act that is filmed and project live on a, a hair balloon. So it's it's a beautiful piece of the show. I would I say it's a piece part of the set, but it's also a character in itself. Well, let's let's talk about the performers, and I, I believe you have one with us. Uh, David Locke is available, I'm assuming. Yes. Well, he's just finishing a training on stage right now. I'm asking oh. him to come and meet us in a second. Okay. Well, we'll keep talking. Let me know when he sh- when he shows up, and we'll get him in right away. Um, so, how do you find? Perfect. So, how do you find performers? How do you? F- how, what's the audition process like? Because it's not easy to find someone who knows how to ride a BMX bike upside down in a cage and then flip on a net. Right. <laughs> so um, I would say that the casting is a big part of Cirque du Soleil and why we are so rich and have talented people working for us. There's different processes and different ways to become an artist for Cirque du Soleil. Either you'll participate in an audition because we host auditions in big cities around the world twice a year approximately. Uh, or you'll send a video, a demo of what you do, and and then you'll get a call from Cirque who would like to come and see you in person or would invite you to Montreal uh, to come and present it in our studios. Uh, so we create this database of artists going from uh, contortionists to jugglers to clowns to actors to very small person, a very different range of talent and, and discipline. And... And once we start and create a new show, the director will kind of make a list, a wish list of these are the acts I would like to have in the show and these are, are the type of actors or, or characters I would like to have in the show. And then casting will go and scout through our database of artists and then make some proposition to the director. And if some of these artists we don't have in our database, depending on the requirements, they'll go and, and, and scout around the world to find more of what the director would like to have. So... Yes, we have a cast and curious of 46 artists coming from 15 d- different nationalities and from different backgrounds. Uh, some of them come from trampolinists or, or sports and athlete, athletes background, and other ones are more actors or, or come from very traditional circus arts and circus schools. 
And then you have some artists like David, who we'll speak to very soon, who uh, came from a gymnastic background and also learned how to do many different disciplines in order to become versatile and, and kind of be a great asset for Cirque du Soleil. Because in this show, he's jumping on the Acronet, which is kind of a, a massive trampoline, never seen before technology um, that required some... Yes, trampolinists, but gymnasts or, or artists that are willing to jump so high in the air that's never been done before and then bounce on the surface that's, that looks tra- transparent when, you, when you're jumping up high and you're looking down. It looks like you're going to land straight on the stage, but the net is still there, and it's, it's quite impressive what he can do. Oh, I, I, it's quite impressive what they can all do because I've, I've seen them, and I, I think I've pulled a muscle just watching them. Uh, it's such amazing. <laughs> they 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 really are amazing. So at these auditions, would it be in a, and not that I'm hoping to ever audition because I'm old and, and lame, but uh, I can't do any of those flips. But are you looking for people who have truly unique s- skills that you've not seen before, or are you looking for someone who is versatile and can be taught the, the stuff that you already know, or are you looking for a combination? Definitely a combination. Like if I take, for example, the Rola Bola act in Curious, which is the aviator character, Hamis, the artist who's from Colombia, who was raised in a circus family, is pretty much the only one in the world who can do what he does. So Michelle Apri saw him once doing some competitions uh, in circus world and, and decided, I want him. I want his act in our show. So he came and he was, added as a part of our show, wit is hack, versus some other artists who are more versatile and, and can do different things. So like the house troupe, which is the, the acronet troupe, the guys are also dancing in the opening act of the show. They're acting, they, have to, they need some skills that are not only acrobatic. They need to, be, to have a good presence on stage, they need to act and be able to do all sort of, sort of things. So I would say it's a good combination of all. Um, definitely, if you come from a sport background, then um, and you are very talented, let's say, and Cirque wants you, they see something in you, you might go through the process of getting acting classes as well to kind of develop that acting skill that you need to have on our stages versus when you're competing in, in the sport uh, industry. So how big is the touring company? Because each time I ask a question, it sounds like more and more people are involved. And it sounds like quite an a undertaking just to physically move people from city to city. Right. So we're 116 of us uh, working and traveling with Curious. And, um, well, that's the cast of 46. And then you have all the technicians that are in charge of the show the technical department, the artistic department, and then you also have the tour services and the company manager who are the people who are in charge of our lodging, our traveling, our visas. So all of this. And then you also have the front of house team, which is the customer service team. And on top of that, everywhere we go, when we set the tent, we hire about 150 local employees who will be the box office staff, the food and beverage, the merchandising, the ushers, security, uh, our kitchen hires local people as well, and our wardrobe department hires uh, local dressers for the show. So 116 of us traveling, and then with the local people that we hire, we're about 270 people uh, to make this happen every day. That's amazing. And how, what have you found to be the, the, the toughest logistical challenge um, is it has it been coordinating all the visas? Is it is it just the sheer size of some of the props, getting them from town to town? What have you found to be the most challenging uh, thing that you've overcome? Huh, that's a good question. I think each department has their own challenges. Uh, I would say definitely for the tour services people, the the visas and the and the lodging and the transportation is very complicated, but also. Um, the for the technical department is to travel and to set everything and organize everything every city that we go to and then to pack it all up uh, and then travel and then reset it again the next city. So there's very different challenges uh, for artistic department is to make sure that the artists stay in shape, they're healthy, what happens if there's injuries, who are we replacing them with. So there's really depending on what you're your department is, you'll have very different challenges. So the auditions, you look all over the world, you do 
you get a, these 49, 46 folks to do all these amazing stunts. What is the training like? Because you said you have six months to prepare. You, you find the folks and you take six months to really learn everything. What is training like on an average day for a performer? Once the show is ready and opened, every week we will have training on stage. The Acronet, let's say, they have a one hour and a half training on stage every week on top of performing all the shows. So they do between eight to ten shows a week. Uh, they arrive w- w- one hour to one hour and a half before the show starts to do their makeup and, and warm up and get ready for the show. And then they'll have a, a, between one or two training on stage uh, during the day if needed. But um, apart from that, they each have their different routine for working out and training. Some of the guys work out after the show because we have a little gym area here under the tent. Uh, a lot of them work out after the show, which is surprising. You think they'd be performing for two hours, they'll be exhausted. But no, because they, they want to keep working out and they want to make sure that they don't do this before show and don't tire their muscles too much. Uh, others, like the Acronet guys, they'll find a CrossFit gym every city that we go to and they, they go during the day and train at CrossFit. Uh, we also hire a local Pilates teacher and that Pilates teacher will come during the day and give private uh, classes to each of the artists. Uh, we also have, with us touring, we have two uh, physical therapists who are there to prevent injuries and to react in cases of injuries, but they are following the artists so close, knowing all of their acts by heart and seeing and preventing the artists that would do something different than usual. They will see the show and they'll be like, hmm, let's say to the juggler, it'll be like, hey, I saw you do this move today. You never do this usually. Are you compensating? Are you hurt somewhere? Um, and they'll give them treatments, daily and, and weekly treatments, to make sure that their bodies and everything is in tough condition. It's an extremely physical job they're doing. They're, they are truly athletes, regardless if they're dancers or performers or actors. I mean, there's a lot of physical, physicality involved. So injuries are inevitable. I mean, you can prevent them as much as you can, but sometimes it just happens because you're doing so much. Um, when, someone, right. when someone does get hurt, how do you work with replacing them or temporarily or how do you do with the, how do you work with the, around an injury there are different um versions of each act so let's say the um, the acronet guys there's six of seven of them in the act uh you really need to have six people around the guy who's flying to push him and bounce him up in the air so if one of them is injured or sick, he simply has the flu and he cannot come to work because we don't want him to get everybody sick, um, we will take a guy from another uh, act to bring in and to jump on the on the net to bring that bounce and that same effect and power. Uh, the contortionist, there are four girls. Well, we have different three girls versions uh, in case one of them needs to have a day or two days off to rest her back and her muscles. Um, so... There's little different acts and versions like this that we can bring in in order to not impair the show if someone is sick or injured. Uh, And then we also have backup acts. So within that same cast of 46 artists, some of them are understudies for the main characters or for the comics, and, and the backup acts are the acts that we would need to replace. Like, let's say the Rola Bola, I told you he's, He's the only one in the world that can do what he does. So obviously, if he's out of the show, then we cannot present his act because no one else can do that. But we have a backup act for that um, that maybe you most likely will not see if you come see the show. But sometimes it happens. You could come and see the show and see the backup act in case. Basically, we're keeping the same length uh, and duration of the show. So you'll come and you'll have a two hours and 15 minute uh, show, including the intermission. But you might see little different things from one time to another. And then when we're talking about serious injuries that will request either a surgery or a six-month time out for an artist, then we bring replacement artists. And this is actually the case of David Locke, who was hired initially as a replacement because one of the guys dislocated his shoulder. So he started as a replacement artist, and he was trained. So there's an integration and a training part before he actually is able to perform in the show because he has to learn 
the different tracks, the the dancing parts. He has to learn how to make his makeup. He has to get used to being on the net, let's say. And then so we hired him as a replacement artist. He was with us for four or five months, and then he went back home to Vegas, and then we just happened to have an opening because, yes, the show has been going on for two years and a half, but we already have artists that are leaving. They're not renewing their contracts, so we need to replace them. So someone from the Acronet um, was leaving us, so we called back uh, David, and we said, look, uh, you're trained already. You know the act. You're talented. We want you for the long term now, and now you signed with us. So there is, when it's long-term injuries or long-term time out of the show, then we bring replacement artists. And and that database that we talked about earlier must come in very handy at that moment. Um, do you do you get people on standby just to let them know when you're traveling that this may happen or when you're touring, or do they just kind of wait until something goes happens and then call them up? So we wait until something goes uh, for the touring shows. It's different for the Vegas shows. The resident shows they all have on call artists because in Vegas there's such a a big crowd of artists and Cirque du Soleil acrobats that are there. Like some, some will be on call for both like Mystère and Ka or for different shows. So they have the, the chance to have on call artists, which we don't hear on tour because it's always a question of getting visas for that person to work and everything. So we cannot just have on call people that are standby. Um, but, uh, in the meantime, we, we adapt. If there is something that happens and then quickly we need to replace someone, we adapt the show. We have the different version, and then we'll bring someone new as soon as possible and train that person and make a costume for that person. But once you have a person that is trained, that has a costume that fits him or her, then it's most likely that we're going to call back that same person if we need. Because uh, obviously the the time that was already invested in training that person is, is priceless. Well. One last question before I let you go, and I certainly appreciate your time today. On a personal level, how has Cirque du Soleil affected you as a person, and, and how have you enjoyed working for such a, a strange job? I mean, this is, this is one of the most unique places to work, Cirque du Soleil. Not everybody gets a chance to do it, and it seems like it's not only hard and difficult, but also fun. So what, personally, what has been the best part of Cirque du Soleil for you? Well, being from Quebec, I guess it was part of my background growing up, already dreaming of working for Cirque du Soleil because it's such a company that is renowned and, and that is part of our lives from a very, very young age, being from Quebec. Um, so I guess once I started touring, one thing I didn't know, it was how my life is going to be touring with a show or how everybody's going to become my friend or my extended family kind of thing. And the privilege of doing what we do, I think, is like no matter how hard it is to be away from your friends and family or from your home for a long period of time, we are very close. And, and we manage to bring fantasy and, and inspiration to about 2,000, 2,600 people every night in the audience. And sometimes I feel like I'm working, I'm on my computer, and I think it's a rough day and I have no motivation. Then I'll go and sit down in the audience for just one act, and I'll see everybody's faces and smiling and being in awe and clapping. And I think that's the best thing um, to to reassure you when you're kind of doubting, why did I leave home and why am I touring? It's, I think it's seeing how much joy and happiness we bring to the audiences that we present the show to. And on top of that, traveling and getting to visit the world is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, it's definitely a dream job. Well, just to remind folks, the it's Curios. It's going to be on the Sam Houston Race Park, April 6th through April 30th, 2017. I and my wife will definitely be there for probably more than one show. So if you want to send comp tickets, go ahead. But otherwise, we will more than <laughs> happily pay to see the great show that you always put on no matter where it is. So thank you for your time, Emily. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast, Craig. It was a pleasure, and uh, hopefully we'll get to meet once the show arrives in town. Absolutely. That's the show. Thanks again to Amelie for her time, as well as big thanks to LaTanya for helping get this scheduled. Don't forget to order tickets now at CirqueDoSoleil.com slash Curios. Feel free to follow us on Twitter at RealityCheckPod. Like the Facebook page. Head over to RealityCheckPodcast.com to sign up for the newsletter or download the app. Any comments, questions, or guest suggestions should go to Craig at SpeakerCraigPrice.com. See you next week. <laughs>